Hello and welcome everybody to the second Shaw IAU workshop on astronomy for education. This is our big opening event. What you saw before there was Haus der Astronomie, literally House of Astronomy, the Center for Astronomy Education and Outreach in Heidelberg that is the host of the Office of the Astronomy uh, Office of Astronomy for Education. And the very fact that we are not currently in this nice galaxy-shaped building and that, in fact, we are not physically in any institution meeting together in a regular meeting, that shows you, of course, that we are in a very special situation. You all know what that situation is. We are in a crisis. It is currently a pandemic. It is also, sadly, not the only crisis that we are currently in. Humanity is also right in the middle of the climate crisis. And what this goes to show is that science, science communication, and science education have become more important than ever. We need people to understand the science. We need people to have a good idea about which results they can trust, about which results are important, because otherwise we are never going to manage those crises um, as you, in, with humanity as a whole. So that, if you will, is the bigger setting for our workshop. All of you, and um, there have been, I believe, 330 registered participants so far. All of you are with me currently virtually. And those of you who need subtitles, we do have live captioning, and right now, for all of you who are in Hop-In, um, in the chat on the right, you, say, uh, you should see a pinned message that tells you where to find the live captioning subtitles. All right, so um, coming back to the crisis and coming back to the responsibility of science for supporting actions against the pandemic, against the climate crisis, um, this is an area where science is responsible, where we have responsibilities as professional scientists. And if you will, this whole event where we are currently at this Shaw IAU workshop in astronomy for education exists because the IAU, the International Astronomical Union, as the professional umbrella organization of astronomers worldwide, has stepped up and is taking this responsibility seriously and has created an initiative at an institution, namely the Office of Astronomy for Education, that is meant to foster science education in general, astronomy education in particular, in secondary schools and in primary schools, and in this way contribute to the science and the science liter literacy that we need in order so that humanity can deal with its serious crises. So this is the setup of what we are doing here. Why astronomy? Of course, for most of us who are here at this workshop, why astronomy is not a question because we all know how fascinating astronomy is. Um, there, are several, there are several aspects to this, of course. Um, one is that astronomy has fascinating images, but another is also that astronomy deals with some of the most extreme phenomena in the universe. And today is a special day in two respects. First of all, it is now 25 years to the day that the discovery of the, the, firm, the first firm discovery of an exoplanet, of a planet orbiting a star other than the sun, was announced. So that was exactly 25 
years ago and the search for planets around other stars and at some stage for life on these planets remains one of the most fascinating topics of astronomy. And the other topic, of course, is that um, today the Nobel, Prize is, the Nobel Prize in Physics was announced and it goes to three scientists, to Andrea Gies, to Reinhard Genzel and to Roger Penrose, who are who have um, researched one of the again one of the most popular fascinating phenomena on uh, in astronomy, namely black holes. In the case of um, Sir Roger, on a theoretical basis, showing that really within general relativity, it is inevitable in certain situations that a black hole will form. And in the case of the other two, Andrea Ges of UCLA and Reinhard Genzel. Um, of the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics um, in observing stars around what is the central supermassive black hole of our own Milky Way, and in this way amassing the first direct observational evidence of there really being such an extreme object like a black hole. So um, astronomy is a subject that has wide powers of fascination for pupils, for students, which is our concern, again, primary and secondary school, also for the general public. And one of the themes that is behind what we as astronomers do to support school education is using astronomy as an entry science, as a, as an, as a, as a low threshold entry into the world of STEM, of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And of course, this is not a new effort. There have been lots of projects by various scientists, astronomers, other scientists to bring astronomers into schools. Um, all of you are probably familiar, for instance, with the Universe Awareness pro uh, Project. Um, there's, there have been systematic teacher training projects like NASA or GTTP, or projects like the Global Hands-On Universe, bringing remote observations to school. So there has been a lot going on, and there are many astronomers committed to really bringing astronomy into schools using astronomy for STEM education. But today, with this festive opening of the Office of Astronomy for Education, marks an additional step, and that is additional step is the IAU as the International Organization for Astronomy, creating an office specifically for the purpose, creating an institution. And that always has a lot, a lot more heft behind it when it comes to really fulfilling a mission, in this case, our mission to support STEM education in schools. So um, this is where we are at, and we are very glad that both from the IAU and from the sides of our funders who have made this possible, um, we have representatives, and we are going to hear from them now. So um, to start with, I would like to ask Ivine van Dieshoek to the stage. Professor van Dieshoek is the president of the International Astronomical Union. Um, hello, Ivine. Nice to have you here and glad to share this moment with you. And Professor van Dieshoek is going to tell us a little bit about how all of this began. So let us just set her up. And Ivine, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. So dear Minister Bauer, dear Mrs. Spiegel, dear Professor Young, dear friends, colleagues, educators around the world, I really wish that we could be all be together in this beautiful house there, Sonomi, that you just saw in this movie in Heidelberg. I've enjoyed being there myself a number of times and I know what a stimulating place it can be, especially to celebrate this birth of the, IA, of the OAE and also to meet each other and to get to know each other. But no matter how difficult this current situation is, and I know that everybody here around the world is struggling um, with this strange new world that we are living in, it also opens opportunities that we have not had before. And one of them is actually the broad participation that we can have through one of these virtual meetings, rather than having maybe a hundred people together in Heidelberg, we now have the opportunity to meet virtually with more than 300 people around the world. So let me tell you a little bit about the uh, 
IAU and how the Office of Astronomy Education came about, because not everybody who may be here on this uh, meeting is familiar with the uh, uh, IAU and the OE. And we are actually the Worldwide Union of Professional Astronomers, and our mission is very simple, to promote and safeguard astronomy in all of its aspects, and through international collaboration. We have more than 107 nationalities and more than 14,000 members across the world. And these days, that's much more than just research and scientific meetings. It also involves communication, it involves development, and it involves education. And this last point is, of course, what it's all about here today. So what does the IAU do? Uh, well, for that, we refer you to our new strategic plan uh, that was uh, launched and approved by the General Assembly in 2018 and that you can find and post it at our website. In it, we uh, stress a number of goals that we have for the coming decade, and one of them is definitely education. Um, and in order to carry out all of these activities and functions that we envision in the strategic plan, uh, the IAU actually has a number of offices. Of course, the IAU and its members, they are the astronomers, they are about advancing knowledge in astronomy. Uh, but then we also have the uh, um, training of young astronomers. The IAU has been doing uh, science advancements already for more than a century now. We just celebrated our 100 years. Um, but already in 1967, we started the International School for Young Astronomers. So this is really training young astronomers at master and PhD level. And a number of years ago, this was formalized in the Office for Young Astronomer at the Norwegian Academy in Oslo. Then in 2011 came the Office of Astronomy for Development in Cape Town. In 2015, the uh, Office for, for Astronomy Outreach in Tokyo, mostly about communication. And then we are very happy to add and complete this family of offices uh, with the uh, Office of Astronomy for Education in Heidelberg uh, in 2019. And Teresa Lago will tell a lot more about how this uh, selection was done and how the uh, OAE came uh, to work. Um, and she has certainly played a very important role in making this happen. So if you go to our strategic plan, this is goal number five, um, basically saying that we stimulate the use of astronomy for teaching and education at school level. Wording is important here. It's not teaching of astronomy. It's basically using astronomy for teaching and education at school level. And that's what it's all about. So we listed already a number of objectives for the OAE in 2018, and it's really the challenge of Marcus and his team uh, to, uh, to see uh, whether this can be implemented, uh, establish a network of national astronomy education coordinators in the different countries that has been extremely successful, and uh, I think they can be very proud of the network of more than uh, 200 NAICs that have already been uh, uh, enlisted. Of course, analyze. Uh, astronomy and teaching, materials, guidelines is very important. Uh, eventually, then also linking, uh, liaising with the ministries and curriculum experts. Encouraging standards for teacher training activities is very important. Uh, organize an annual school for um, astronomy education, and then also build up a database of uh, material. As Marcus mentioned already, the IAU has certainly been active already. Also, astronomers individually have been active already. Uh, this is just one example of a number uh, of events that were done in the context of our 100-year celebrations, where you see here activities in school ranging from South Africa, Africa to the Middle East, to um, Brazil, to all kinds of places where uh, really, Astronomy Day in schools is something that will continue also for the coming uh, years. Teacher training was mentioned already across the world, um, coming out also of the um, International Year for Astronomy, uh, Galileo teacher training, NASA, UNAVE, Open Astronomy Schools, all very successful uh, activities already, often involving also small telescopes, which, which you can do a huge amount of training already in also very remote places, like you see here in Mongolia, in Africa, and we've had wonderful examples in Principe Island uh, when we were celebrating the 100th year um, of the solar eclipse. Indeed, gravity 
is uh, um, one of the topics that is very well suited for um, uh, education, especially at high schools. And this is again one of the examples um, of activities that we had last year of the Einstein schools in basically stressing the role of gravity. Um, and then again, in connections with solar eclipse, but also in the connection with black holes. And indeed, what a fantastic day it is today, uh, with the Nobel Prize uh, uh, awarded to the black holes. Uh, but I would like to stress here that actually the Shaw Prize the Foundation, which is sponsoring uh, these meetings, um, was actually well ahead of the Nobel Prize in giving the Shaw Prize to Professor Reinhard Gensel already in 2008. So you see here the nice uh, progression here uh, um, coming. Um, diversity, uh, encouraging women, that's something that is very high on our agenda um, that we stress every year sort of in February around the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And this shows again in 2019, we had a, a large number of activities in, in many different countries. And this is really the strength of the IAU, that we have this huge network with which we can roll out these activities uh, um, globally uh, across, the, across the globe. As Marcus already said, the future of humanity, the future of Earth is really with the next generation. It's so important that they get a proper education. Um, that's really uh, what it's going to be all about. And astronomy is really this very low threshold gateway into the sciences, the sciences that we will need to uh, solve the world's uh, crisis. And just last week, Minister Pandor at a UN event gave a wonderfully inspirational speech <clears throat> in which she stressed the importance of astronomy for curiosity, for optimism, for hope that it brings us. Because if you get young children in interested, if you get them curious, then that is really a driver for innovation. It doesn't have to be in astronomy, it can be anywhere else in society, but you need to catch that curiosity. And that's what I think Professor Schauberg will tell us more about later. So let's make sure that through the OAE, we can harness this inspiration of astronomy for science education. I want to thank the Klaus Tschirsch Stiftung and the Karl Zeiss Stiftung for uh, supporting the OAE so generously. That's really wonderful to see. Thanks to the Shaw Prize Foundation for sponsoring these workshops. And I wish Marcus and his entire team at the OAE and all the NAACs across the world, I wish you all the best with your endeavors in the coming years. Thank you very much. Hold on, there was the traditional, every digital meeting needs somebody who is muted, right? So I'm glad that we have got that, um, that we have got that over with. Um, so um, let's, first of all, thank you, Avina, for those, for those kinds, uh, for those kinds, wo kind words. Um, the reason that I'm a little bit distracted is that we're trying to get the next, the next speaker on. Um, they seem to be working with their camera. So I think I'm just going to permute our schedule a little bit and first play the message from the Klaus Chira Foundation. The Klaus Chira Foundation is the foundation that is also responsible for building the Haus der Astronomie, the galaxy-shaped building that you have seen in the that you have seen in the beginning in the trailer and they are also generously supporting the office of astronomy for education and we are very glad that the managing director of the klaus Schirer foundation beate spiegel has sent us a message of greeting dear participants of the second shaw iau workshop for astronomy for education Dear Astronomy Educators, dear Astronomy Community. Als Geschäftsführerin der Klaus-Tschirer-Stiftung freue ich mich, ein kurzes Grußwort an Sie zu richten. 
Die Klaus-Tschirra-Stiftung engagiert sich seit 25 Jahren in den Bereichen Naturwissenschaften, Mathematik und Informatik. Die Astronomie ist uns dabei schon immer ein besonderes Anliegen gewesen. Im Jahr 2011 haben wir das spektakuläre Haus der Astronomie in Heidelberg gebaut, das Sie jetzt leider nur virtuell sehen können und wo jetzt auch das Office of Astronomy for Education angesiedelt ist. Mit ihren faszinierenden Bildern und leuchtenden Darstellungen weiß die Astronomie ganz besonders zu begeistern. Sie kann als ideale Einstiegswissenschaft in den MINT-Bereich dienen, wenn die erste Faszination in tiefgehendes Verständnis gewandelt wird. Wir freuen uns, dass das Schülerinteresse an der Astronomie nach wie vor sehr hoch ist und sehen es als Chance, es als Chance Menschen, junge Menschen die Welt zu eröffnen. Die aktuelle Covid-19-Krise hat uns auch gezeigt, dass in der Wissenschaft Deswegen ist es wichtiger, denn je über Bildungsgerechtigkeit zu sprechen. Das heißt, das heißt wie können Schülerinnen und Schüler gleichermaßen, gleichermaßen schon ab und an erreicht, erreicht werden? Wie gestalten wie wir diese wir diese inklusiv und divers? divers? Wie schaffen wir das Interesse an der Astronomie unabhängig von sozialem Hintergrund und technischer Ausstattung fördern? Um diese drängenden Fragen mit Antworten begegnen zu können, braucht es Inspiration. Deswegen freue ich mich, dass Sie alle diesen Austausch wagen und diesen Workshop mit Ihren Perspektiven bereichern. Ich wünsche Ihnen allen, wünsche Ihnen allen in den nächsten Tagen spannende, Tagen, spannende Diskussion Diskussion und tolle Tage und tolle Austausch, Tage miteinander. Austausch miteinander. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Okay, so thank you to the Klaus Jira Foundation both for that message and, of course, much more for the support that they've shown both House to Astronomy and now the Office of Astronomy for Education, because it is clear that if you create an institution like this, if you really pour resources into a certain mission, then you need strong support, you need funders, and we are very happy that we have found a number of funders who are really committed to supporting this. So um, we have heard from the Klaus Jira Foundation Next, I'm going to ask Theresia Bauer to join me here on stage. Um, Minister Bauer, thank you so much for sharing this moment with us. Um, Haus der Astronomie, as you know, is in the state of Baden-Württemberg, the German southwestern state of Baden-Württemberg. And part of why Haus der Astronomie works as well as it does is that this state has a particularly favorable infrastructure for science and Minister Bauer has been a supporter of House to Astronomy since the project's inception. And we are very happy that she continues to support us. Thank you very much for that. She is here um, at this point, not as the Minister for Science, Research and the Arts of Baden-Württemberg, but she has her other hat on, namely as the chair of the Carl Zeiss Foundation, um, which supports the Office of Astronomy for Education with funding. Um, Minister Bauer, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I hope we heard because we had some technical problems. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, as the Minister of Science of, of the State of Baden-Württemberg, also Chairwoman of the Carl Zeiss Foundation, and a little bit more personally as a citizen of Heidelberg, I'm thrilled that the International Astronomical Union choose the House der Astronomie, HDA, and Heidelberg to be the new home of the Office of Astronomy for Education. The Carl Zeiss Foundation has always had a close connection with astronomy. Our founding companies are well known in this field, be it for the planetariums and the telescopes by Zeiss, or the telescope mirrors by shot. And our foundation strongly believes that in order to achieve future scientific breakthroughs, we first need to excite the public for science itself. And that fits perfectly with the OAE's goals to excite and inspire young people for the fascinating field of astronomy. This is why we were excited to support the application of the HDA and to finance the position for an astronomy education research coordinator. This role is funded for the next five years 
with a total of 360,000 euro and we hope to continue the funding for another five years after successful evaluation. This is in addition to a current funding project of at HDA for teacher training in the unique inverted classroom principle. According to this idea, content, content is developed by the students at home using videos, texts, and online tests. The students then late gain more up in deep in depth knowledge and practice through in person teaching exercises and discussions. Digital education will be a key focus of the OAE's network. And the pandemic has reminded that research projects and initiatives go in, into digital education will become even more important in the future. The OAE's, the OAE will provide important support for existing, existing initiatives and help encourage further connections and networking in the field of astronomy education. The OAE is another pillar for Heidelberg as a center of scientific research and education in the field of astronomy. So to close, I would like to wish the Haus der Astronomie and the International Astronomical Union Great success for the further development of the Office of Astronomy of Education. And I wish you all an inspiring workshop and good luck for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Bauer, both for the kind words, the good wishes, and of course, for the staunch support that you have shown us. And this is a very exciting development. And I think there's interesting developments for all of us. Ahead. So thank you for sharing this moment with us. All right. Um, the Shaw IAU workshop, if you look at the name of this workshop, Shaw IAU, that is the third major funder of the Office of Astronomy for Education, namely the Shaw Prize Foundation. And as you as the name shows, the Shaw uh, Prize Foundation's funding for the OAE is specifically for an annual workshop that brings together astronomy educators, astronomy education practitioners, professional astronomers for frank exchanges and for networking in, well, in what was originally, of course, envisaged to be a live meeting, but which this year has turned out to be a virtual meeting um, in fact, as Ivina van Dysok has already pointed out, for the kickoff of the Office of Astronomy for Education, for meeting this network of around 250 national astronomy education coordinators, 250 NIACs from almost 80 countries, and their number is still growing, both in terms of the countries joining and in, con in terms of the individuals volunteering for these positions. So in forging this network, this virtual format that brings us all together um, in a way that we would never have managed in a single physical meeting is, is actually quite advantageous for us. So we are quite happy that the Shaw Prize Foundation has agreed to fund this virtual event as well, the second Shaw IAU workshop on astronomy for education. And we are happy that Kenneth Young, who is the chairman of the Shaw Prize Council, and also the vice chair for the board of adjudicators of the Shaw Prize is giving us a message from the Shaw Prize Foundation on the occasion of this workshop. So without further ado, the message from Professor Young. Dr. Van Dyshoek, Dr. Largo, Dr. Purcell, Minister Bauer, Ms. Spiegel, Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Shaw Prize Foundation, I offer greetings to the Shaw IAU Workshop 2020, organized by the IAU Office of Astronomy for Education. Astronomy is one of three prizes offered by the Shaw Prize Foundation. The Shaw Prize was established under the auspices of Mr. Run Run Shaw in 2002. Since 2004, the prize has been awarded annually for distinguished and significant achievements 
in the three scientific disciplines, namely astronomy, life science and medicine, and mathematical sciences. The awards made without regard to race, nationality, gender and religious belief are dedicated to furthering societal progress, enhancing quality of life and enriching humanity's spiritual civilization. Goals that are surely resonant with IAU and with the Initiative on Astronomy for Education. In 2019, IAU and the Shaw Prize Foundation decided to launch formal collaborations and this series of workshops are among the fruits of that joint effort. It is gratifying to see a global network established in December 2019, in part as the result of the first workshop. We understand that some 250 national astronomy education coordinators across nearly 80 countries constitute the largest group of participants at this second workshop. This network will link different communities along at these two dimensions. First, and obviously uh, reaching across national boundaries. And secondly, bridging the community of astronomical researchers and the community of educators. This is reflected in the membership of the network and participation in this workshop. For we have professional astronomers, teachers, as well as amateur astronomers drawn from many regions. These linkages are important not only for advancing the course of astronomy around the world, but also for advancing the wider course of shared values of humanity and shared visions for the future of humankind. The stars, the galaxies and the cosmos are subjects of great interest to young people and magnets that draw them into an intellectual world that is on the one hand driven by curiosity and unbridled imagination, and on the other hand, firmly rooted in empiricism and rationality. We all look forward to the keynote address by Professor Stjoberg to hear about his research that reveals the width and depth which characterize the interest of young people in astronomy. It is important that we all work together to fuel that enthusiasm. For further advances in astronomy and in science, rest on the genius and dedication of the next generation. We offer best wishes to IAU for the success of this workshop. Indeed, nothing would please us more than if these endeavours would inspire teenagers who, say, 20, 30 or 40 years from now, were to contribute to major advances and win short prizes in astronomy. Thank you. So, Thank you, Professor Young, for these kind words and for the Shaw Prize Foundation of their support of this event and in general of the Office of Astronomy for Education. So next we will hear from Teresa Lago. Teresa is, hold on, Teresa, you will join me on stage here. Hello, Teresa. Hello. So let me briefly introduce you. So Teresa is the Secretary General of the International Astronomical Union. She is also one of the pioneers of establishing modern astronomy and also modern astronomy university education um, in Portugal. And specifically for us, Teresa is our main contact point to the IAU and has been in this process that began um, as soon as the IAU told us that we would have the honor of hosting the Office of Astronomy for Education. So. Teresa, on this occasion, many thanks for this really pleasant and fruitful collaboration. It is great that you always have an open ear for us and it has made the establishment of the Office of Astronomy for Education that much easier. So um, you are going to tell us something about, a little bit more about how all of this came about. So the stage is yours. Uh, I begin to, by greeting the representatives of the IEU partners in the Office of Astronomy for Education, the speakers of this session, the OAE team, and all the national astronomy education coordinators participating in the workshop. 
the creation of the new Office of Astronomy for Education was proposed in the 2020-2030 IAU strategic plan approved at the Vienna General Assembly in August 2018. Bearing in mind that my three years term as IAU General Secretary also started then, establishing the new office in such a short time was clearly a challenge. It required quick action and so, just one month after the GA, I launched an international call specifying the main objectives of the office and requesting detailed letters of intent towards the office in partnership with the IAU. At the end of December 2018, receiving 23 letters from potential hosts on all continents was an excellent surprise. The letters of intent were evaluated by a high-level ad hoc committee set up for this purpose. And at the end of February 2019, the IAU issued nine invitations to submit proposals in a specific format. In June 2019, the deadline for accepting proposals Six proposals were received to us, the office. Four from Europe, from France, Germany, Italy, and Netherlands, and two from Asia, one from China, and one from India. The evaluation led to a clear ranking, with the proposal presented by the House of Astronomy in Heidelberg in the first place. However, as astronomy is so relevant to education, the IAU decided to be creative and capitalize on the huge interest generated around the world. And so the concept evolved to become more inclusive. An IAU Office of Astronomy for Education extended through a worldwide network of regional and national centers and nodes. Meanwhile, there was another very positive event. The signing in April 2019 of a cooperation agreement between the IEU and the Show Prize Foundation to promote together astronomy and the use of astronomy for education. The Show Prize Foundation would fund the annual Show IEU workshop on astronomy for education which was one of the major activities planned for the new office. As this generous support would begin as early as 2019, the IAU Secretariat took the initiative to organize the first show IAU workshop at its premises in Paris in December 2019. The objective was to set up a stage not only for the public presentation of the proposal selected for the OAE, but also to be involved in the discussion of the future office, the representatives of the various high-level institutions and the consortia that responded to the initial call. The first workshop involved 48 invited participants from among the many applicants from 26 countries. The plans for the new office were presented by the designated director and the deputy director of the OAE, but other interesting concepts proposed by the participants were also discussed. It was an exciting workshop. We shared ideas, ambitions, experience and practices. I believe that this meeting played a decisive role in promoting the new office and provided an excellent opportunity to lay a solid foundation for the future global network of an inclusive Office of Astronomy for Education and centers and nodes around the world. During the workshop, the agreement between the IAU and the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg was signed symbolically witnessed by the workshop participants. 
considering the success of its creation and also the general support received from various foundations and organizations, I must say that the birth of the OAE could not have taken place under a more auspicious sky. OE started its activity in January this year, and it's very gratifying to witness the work already done. The recruitment of promising staff, the setup of an already considerable network of national astronomy education coordinators, the negotiations underway for the constitution of several centers and nodes, the organization of this second workshop. And all this has been achieved despite the current restrictions and difficult conditions of the pandemic. To conclude, I am delighted and optimistic about the harmonious development of the Office of Astronomy for Education, dynamic and auspicious, with all the conditions to become the world reference in astronomy for education. So thank you, Teresa, for those kind words. And of course, you're also, I mean, you have given us a mission and I think we are going to, it's going to be an exciting journey that we're going to take together also to take um, take together with all of those of you out there who are gathered in this in this virtual setting. And I think the next days where we have a number of exciting talks from various individuals around the world representing very different environments of astronomy education um, are going to be a really important step forward here. So thank you. And of course, thank you for your support. A number of speakers in this opening event have talked about astronomy as an entry science, as particularly interesting for students and pupils. And I would expect that most of us have made this experience ourselves as we communicate astronomy to young people, to the general public. But of course, we are scientists, so it makes sense to ask the question a little bit more systematically. So just what is the interest of pupils, of high school students, of primary school students in science? And we are very glad that this local afternoon here in Heidelberg, at least, we have with us one of the best persons to ask exactly that question, namely Professor Sven Sjöberg. Um, he is Professor Emeritus in Science Education at Oslo University, Norway. And a number of you will know him through his Rose study, The Relevance of Science Education. And that, of course, is exactly the question that we've been asking, but this time asked in a scientifically systematic way. So just what is interesting for students, for pupils in the world of, of science, what is what is relevant for them. So I'm very glad that Svein, hello to Oslo, um, that Svein has um, agreed to give the keynote address for this festive opening of the Office of Astronomy for Education. And I can personally attest that the topic of your research is definitely very, very relevant to many people who attend here. And we're looking forward very much to your talk. Svein, the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and uh, to be invited to this um, uh, workshop. Um, and what, uh, what a day we have today. Um, just when I was uh, preparing for this talk, I got, we got all this fantastic uh, news of the day that uh, the Nobel Prize uh, in Physics is uh, going to Pen Roger Penrose and three other scientists. And I must say that Roger Penrose was, when I was a student in the nuclear physics, Penrose was one of my heroes. And I think now he will uh, put uh, space science uh, on the, very much on the agenda for, uh, also for education. 
And I strongly recommend you to look not only at the physics that Penrose has written, Roger Penrose has written, but also he was a great humanist and he was a great educator. It not only was, he still is. So I recommend you strongly to look into the values and the perspectives that he uh, gives also in his more popular science writing. So this is a wonderful day. Um, I will talk about uh, one particular project, but I thought um, I would put it on the um, on the scene by saying something about competing influences that we have on um, science education and education policy in, in general. And of course, I'm simplifying, but on the one hand, we can say that we have the the UN system, like uh, UNESCO and UNICEF and UNEP and UNDP and so on with the sustainable development goals and um, <clears throat> key concerns about the global solidarity for peace, sustainable development, uh, climate change, poverty, eradication and equity. These are key concerns as, as we all know. On the other hand, I'm simplifying very much. We have the OECD and the World Bank and also some other institutions where the prime concern in education is on educational gr economic growth, competitiveness and accountability, often test-based accountability and free trade and market economy, possibly also privatization. And the main instrument for that is the PISA test that I suppose most of you would uh, know about and the country rankings that come out of that as a main policy driver for the above mentioned um, policy. And, and just to remind you, these are the uh, UN uh, sustain, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, 17 in total. Many of them relate directly to our work in education. And as number four, quality education is also mentioned explicitly there on the fourth. But all the others also relate to science education. Now we have, um, on the other uh, side, we have um, a lot of international studies of achievement, and it's indeed, I would call it a growing industry, part of globalization. Here are some of the logos uh, of uh, these uh, projects. Um, and they, uh, they, it's a multiple, quite a lot of them. And um, they come and go, or rather they, they don't only come. And when the OECD <coughs> entered the scene, uh, some 20 years ago now, with its PISA project, uh, these, in, uh, these international studies, and in particular PISA, got immense publicity and uh, meant a lot for educational policy. And if you look at how the PISA leader, Andrea Schleicher, in a very well-visited TED talk summarizes, or even actually starts his presentation of PISA, he said that, he says that, PISA is really a story on how international comparisons have globalized the field of education that we usually treat as an affair of domestic policy. Uh, that's, uh, I think it, it's a fair analysis and they are very honest about it. And it creates, um, since we are in Germany now, or at least some of us, uh, this was the presentation when the first PISA results came to um, be published. We had headlines all over the world. And in most countries, uh, there was a scandal and Schule macht dumm here in the Die Woche. Uh, you don't need to know very much German in order to understand the message. And currently, we also see that PISA is used and abused um, in American policy, where uh, Donald Trump and his uh, best of divorce as uh, Minister of Education are using PISA results to push education privatization in order to increase the efficiency of education. So we have a turmoil in um, and discussion in um, in educational scene, and it has become quite a global education range uh, race, and PISA has become the prime driver for that. Uh, what gets attention is the um, PISA results. The, the rankings are often getting most publici publicity, and results are often presented or nearly always presented as kind of uh, graphs like this, where you have a country rankings uh, from winners to losers. And as you can see here, 
this was when 2006 when science was uh, for the first time the core project the core uh, uh, subject finland on top and of course that created a kind of pisa tourism to finland where educators came there to copy what they were doing and indeed wanted to buy the finnish education system more or less um, but uh, what get less attention is that PSI is actually also asking some questions about interest in science. Uh, would you like to learn more of it? Would you like to have a job in it? Would you like to, are you curious about it? Do you want to study it? And they can make a kind of uh, science interest score. And here we have the ranking of the same, from the same students, uh, but on this science interest score. And if you scrutinize this, you will find that at the very bottom of this scale, you find, find Finland. So if you want to copy a country, at least you should take much, very much care in looking not just at the rankings, but also on the wealth of other data supplied by this, uh, these projects. Now, this is just a starter, uh, but uh, this, uh, this raises some, some concerns. And in this project that I will present to you, uh, called the relevance of uh, science education, and you actually see we have turned the, uh, the world a little upside down here, or uh, possibly the right way in, the, uh, in our logo. Uh, very briefly, it is a kind of grassroots study. It's not organized by governments. It's organized by science educators uh, with worldwide participation. Uh, based on shared values and shared beliefs. Um, participants were invited uh, through different organizations for science education research. And we ended up with some 70, 80 interested uh, researchers in the same number of countries. Um, and our, our underlying values and concerns are very much in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals that I've just um, draw your attention to. Uh, and also the fact that um, the lifelong perspective is more important than to have high test scores at the age of 15. Uh, attitudes and values last longer than actually knowing, uh, remembering the contents. So at the attitudinal motivational aspects, the effective uh, dimension of science and technology is of prime importance. Uh, not only for learning, because you are, when you are interested in something, you, you tend to be interested in learning it, but it's also uh, important for, uh, for the future. So our purpose or underlying value is to promote lasting interest in and appreciation of, and also respect for science and technology. And of course, this is uh, not just important for recruiting people to science and technology careers, uh, it's important for the majority because most people will not become engineers or scientists, but they will become citizens taking part in, in, in democracy. So their uh, attitudes and knowledge about science and interested in it is important also for this, for, from this uh, reason. And we want not to have a standard to be matched against, but we want to, to explore diversity and to respect and celebrate cultural diversity all over the world. So this is, um, um, we developed over, we used a year and a half, uh, had a group of science educators, uh, one from each continent actually, and we developed um, uh, an instrument with very, 250 very simple questions under six different headings all of them to be answered on a four point Likert scale, like uh, from disagree to agree. Now the dimensions in, um, in this uh, questionnaire is um, knowing something about what kind of experiences do, do children bring to school. Uh, good educators always bring, uh, want to build on what the learner brings. And, but actually they, they bring different things in different countries, maybe girls and boys have different experiences and so on. And what uh, the, the main point I want to address uh, later in this talk is about what are you curious about? What do, we, what do you want to learn about? Um, not because we want to base 
education simply on what children learn about, want to learn about, but to have some ideas about what kind of interests children have is important. We have some questions on the environmental challenges and perceptions of that. I will come back to that as well. Um, then these children, that's at the, at the age of 15, they look back at uh, five, six, seven years of uh, science at school, and there are also some questions about their attitudes and what they have learned at school, uh, whether they liked it or, or not, and so on. And then some more general attitudes towards uh, science and technology, which is important to, to, to know. Some, aspect, some questions about uh, what is important for you when you shall have an occupation when, or when you want to study, what is for, for their future job. And uh, this is how the um, first page uh, in the English version of the questionnaire looks like, what I want to learn about. And you can, and the first one is stars, planet, and the universe. And you can rank them from one to, uh, uh, from, from not interested to very interested on this liquor scale. Now we got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, international attention to this one, and here we have participants from all these uh, parts of the world. Actually, after we had collected data, a lot of other countries also have joined in and used the instrument for uh, for educational purposes uh, to get the, uh, an overview of the children's attitudes and perceptions. Now Europe has a separate map here, um, and you can see it's also a wide coverage uh, here. Now, go, let me go to the, to, to the meat of this, uh, to the main contents. I will present very simple data, only in single variables, no complicated, uh, um, no complicated uh, um, constructs are made here, but they are in other articles and reports, uh, where you, which you can find on the web. I will give you a, a place to search. And we give here only mean values for girls and boys in different uh, countries. Uh, now here, um, this is how it goes. The statement is science and technology are important for society. And you can rank this from not at all to very much. And here you have the results, how we want to present them. And the system is like this, the countries are sorted more or less by the Human Development Index and partly on geography. And you see um, from uh, the Nordic countries here at the, at the bottom, uh, neighbors and also high on human development level, uh, Japan followed here and so on, Uganda, Ghana, Ghana Lesotho, Swaziland on the other side. And the results are presented here. Uh, um, and you see that uh, the, uh, the, the mean value, and uh, this for girls and this for boys. And you see the overall pattern is that, the overall pattern is that children in most countries agree rather strongly that science and technology are important for society. Although there are some countries that come lower than others, and you can look into details. Uh, here, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and England are somewhat lower, and you have a rather small, uh, gender difference as well, just as an example. This is how I present results. Now we have questions about the environment and sustainable development. And I'll give you the overall pattern is that it's important for all, but it tends to be more so than for, for girls in most countries than for boys. And boys more than girls think that problems are somewhat exaggerated and they trust experts to sort out the problems. Uh, girls, at least more than boys, believe that each individual can make a difference. And girls are more willing than boys to pay the price. Boys are reluctant to that. And I will give you just a few data to, um, to build up, uh, to, to, to show you some, some simple data on this. People should care more about protection of the environment. A very simple question. And as you see here, it's a strong agreement across uh, level of development. And in particular, among girls, you see in most countries, you see the, green, the red dots are to the right of the, the blue ones. We should care more about protection of the environment. Although if you look at some details, uh, 
here on the rather highly developed uh, richest countries, you see that boys tends to tend to be a little reluctant to this statement. Now, I can personally influence what happens with the environment. And here you have a quite mixed picture. Um, and you see that in, um, um, in, in the, these are the Nordic countries, uh, uh, in partic particularly girls uh, think that they can, they can personally make a difference. But if you look uh, scrutinize these results uh, a little more, you see that, for instance, here in England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Ireland, you see that uh, it seems to be what we can call more pessimism uh, than, for instance, comparing with the girls in the Nordic countries. Uh, and this such data can give us, of course, uh, empirical data on which we can base discussions about trying to explain our findings, but that's not what I'm going to do here. I'm just presenting results. Environmental problems should be left to the experts. And here you see uh, the, a, a rather gender difference. Uh, many younger people, especially boys in the rich countries, uh, think that un environmental problems should be left to the experts and there is a group rather large and systematic difference between boys and girls in, in, in most countries, nearly all countries in this data file. You see here that um, Japan may have a problem uh, in the distrust in uh, experts, um, very low for both and boys and in particular for girls. And we have this uh, question, science and technology can solve all environmental problems, a rather sci uh, scientific statement. And you see the same pattern, uh, but even stronger here, that uh, uh, there are many boys uh, that uh, have a st strong belief in that, while girls are much more skeptical or rather uh, realistic, I would say. And you see again that Japan may have um, an issue here. Um, now I come to the interests uh, in science, um, the science curriculum. Actually, we have about 108 questions uh, relating to that, and you can analyze them in different ways. Uh, and I'm just giving you a little glimpse uh, on this. An overall pattern is that the logic when we made, uh, when we selected or made the, the items, we uh, thought we could put the different science contents, which is usually organized in physics, biology, chemistry, the usual sciences, we can put these contents, the science contents in different contexts. And the context could be, for instance, an academic context, a textbook context, technical, personal, social, philosophical, ethical, aesthetical. There are many aspects, many possible context where you can place science. Um, and the overall pattern that we find is that, the, that's the, the overall pattern, is that the more developed the country is, the less overall interest. I'll give you an indication of that. Um, here we have sorted uh, countries according to how many uh, items they in average, how they how they in average rate items, and as you see here, the um, le uh, least developed countries here, uh, in less wealthy countries, uh, the score is very high. You can one should be careful in interpreting that. It may me simply mean that uh, everything is interesting, and going to school is a luxury. Uh, is is not a luxury. It's it's a, it's a privilege and they are curious about absolutely everything because going to school is a luxury. On the other hand, you have uh, the more wealthy countries where going to school is sort of taken for granted and they can be more selective. And as you see here, they also distinguish um, quite uh, much more than um, between the items. Um, they have lowest interest, or we can rather say they are more selective than uh, than the less wealthy countries. So that's an overall pattern that we should bear in mind. 
And also we see that the more developed the country is, the, more, the larger dif gender differences in interests uh, we have. And for, uh, for looking at the gender differences, again, the context is the, is the key word. Um, where, to simplify again, the boys' interest and not the girls' is the technical, mechanical, electrical, spectacular, violent, explosive. And uh, girls' interest, and not so much the boys, is health and medicine, beauty and the human body, ethics, aesthetics, wonder, speculation, and indeed the paranormal. And I'll give you just some examples here. How computers work. And you see the general, general pattern. Uh, quite a, a large gender divide, if you look now at uh, highly industrialized countries. It's a technical context and the, the, there's a strong gender difference and it's growing. The, the, the most developed countries have the largest gender difference. And this question, and now you've guessed the answer, uh, how petrol and en uh, diesel engines work. Um, th this, this is material that often come up in the science curricula and science, science textbooks. And you see here, it's very gendered and it's a very systematic pattern that you see with girls and boys actually more or less having different worlds. Technical context and only of interest for boys. And you guessed it, explosive materials. And you have, again, a very, very strong gender division. And in particular, in highly developed, uh, highly developed countries. Violent and spectacular context, explosive materials. Now, this one, atoms and molecules. It's kind of a heading, more or less, on in a textbook. And you see, it's rather disappointing. Um, for for many science teachers of course uh, rather low in interest uh, the average and with a, a gender pattern and in many countries you see that the percentages are uh, who, who would like to learn more about it is about 10 15 up to 20 percent not very interested and a large gender difference like now and the context I would rather say it's no context here, and uh, we can also call it a school context because textbooks are very often organized according to 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 the uh, to the discipline itself, and low interest in particular for girls. Now, and you see the system now: chemicals, the properties, and how they react. Not very, not very high in score, and with the above mentioned gender difference. Um, chemicals, their properties, and their, how they inter interact. Uh, we can call it no context or academic context uh, or school context. Not very interested and particularly not for girls. Now, what to eat to be keep healthy and fit? You see uh, a similar pattern to, to what we've seen before. Uh, very gendered. Body, this is body and health. Uh, very much girls' interest and with a growing uh, gender difference. Look at the bottom, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Cancer, what we know and how we can cure it. Uh, much higher in interest, uh, average interest, but very much more interesting for girls. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting because, uh, as we all know, cancer can hit <laughs> Uh, men as well as uh, women. So, but uh, health and medicine is very much uh, a girl's interest, and with a growing uh, gender difference, uh, as you can see here on the on, on the graphs. And now I come to uh, to uh, to the core for you at least. Um, space science. Uh, some topics, but not all are interesting and they follow the traditional gender pattern for context that I've just uh, tried to outline for you. Uh, the use of satellites for uh, communication and other purposes. Uh, you see, it's a, it's a technical context. Use as, uh, satellites for communication and other purposes. And it's a gender pattern. And here you have why the stars twinkle and the sky is blue. 
uh, uh, not extremely high, but a, a rather strong uh, gender context and, uh, and gender difference. And you may say it has to do with the beauty and aesthetics, uh, in addition to being also about, uh, say, uh, physics and uh, about physics. How the sunset colors the sky, and you see again a gender difference. Um, and it's again, it's uh, it has to do with beauty and aesthetics, and it's very much uh, girls and not so much boys' uh, interest. Rockets, space, and tra space travel, satellites, and space travel. Again, um, uh, a gender difference, systematic. And this again uh, has a technical context with rockets and satellites and sp space travel. And the, 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 the gender difference here uh, is remarkable. Now, starts, planets, and the universe, a rather neutral statement, um, sort of in the middle, uh, relatively high, but only in the middle. Uh, medium popular for girls and boys, and rather small gender differences. Now, take the, the new one, black holes, supernovas, and other spectacular objects in outer space. Uh, a rather popular uh, um, among um both boys and girls relatively high and this is about some sort of space and wonder curiosity uh, spectacular things and uh, things we really don't know everything about similarly how meteors comets and asteroids may cause disaster on the earth rather rather high in interest and not so much gendered popular for girls and boys Oh, uh, this comes again. Yes, this is a repeat. And the overall winner on top of the list uh, is, is this one, the possibility of life outside Earth. And what we see here is it's, it's, it's popular everywhere and for boys and girls. Space, life, wonder, openness, and it's popular for all. So of all the items, 108 items we had, this had the highest to put it that way, overall score. I will end the presentation with uh, some aspects related to um, <clears throat> what is important for my future work. Uh, what did I think about uh, when, uh, when they are thinking about further studies, further careers, further jobs, and so on? Um, and, and here we see uh, the, 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 the overall finding is that the values, attitudes, and meaning are important for all, but for girls in particular, the values when it comes to choice of future uh, work. And girls' priority more than boys is working with other people, helping other people. And boys' priority is much with more with working with their hands, with things, machines, and tools. Remember, these are 15 year olds, so I mean, the answers are probably not very mature and earning lots of money, becoming the boss at the job and becoming famous. More boys want to have you do that and to have an easy job. So some of them may later get a kind of reality shock when they try to combine all these um, aspects. Uh, I'll um, exemplify. Working with something that fits my attitudes and values. Important for all, but for all, nearly all countries, girls are nearly up to 100% agreeing on with this, uh, with this statement. And in some countries, uh, in highly developed countries, there is a gender pattern, not so important for boys uh, in the kind of richest, uh, richest countries. Working with people rather than things, and I've already given you the answer, and you see that the pattern here. Um, and girls in a cross um, level of development are very interested in that, having a, that as a, an aspect of the work, while boys, and you see in particular here, that the Scandinavian boys are very different from the Scandinavian um, girls. And helping other people, same pattern here, I will not go more in detail, but it's systematic. And um, 
when it comes to um, the, the technical aspect, building, repairing your object using my hands, you see the red dots are very much uh, on the low side here, uh, and uh, but it's interesting for, for boys. I would like, this is a very simple question, I would like to get a job in technology. And you see there is something about the word technology, technology, which is very gendered, and it seems to be it actually across languages and cultures. Uh, but uh, of course, the same pattern that in poor country, everybody want to work with technology uh, because having, and I think you would have get, got the same answer if you asked other questions about future job, because having really a future job is also a luxury for many, of course, in the poorest countries. In wealthy countries, nearly no girls want to work with technology, and even boys are rather ambivalent. Uh, and Japan may have a problem here with, um, with these results, as you can see. And uh, the future work, uh, I would like to become a scientist. And you see it's not very encouraging for... Uh, those of us who uh, work in science and think that we should recruit more people in science. Um, in less uh, developed countries, the story is different. And you see here, uh, especially the girls are very low on, on this one. And look again at Japan. Now, uh, these data that I've shown you uh, are becoming old now. It's, uh, they are collected some 10, 10 years ago. But now there is a new project emerging, uh, not called ROSE, but ROSES, and it will be a follow-up with a, a revised and updated um, questionnaire um, called ROSE Second. Um, a new instrument is already finalized. I'm on the committee, but I will not uh, work directly with it. Researchers from some 50 countries are uh, interested, like they were in the ROSE project. Um, and there will be more weight now on the environmental challenges and sustainable development. Um, and it's led by two Swedish uh, science educators who actually based their own PhD on ROSE. Quite a lot of uh, scholars around the world took their PhDs and uh, master degrees based on the ROSE uh, instrument. Some doing in, uh, only national reports and other doing international comparisons. So new partners are welcome, and uh, the address is here uh, to Anders Yiddersche in uh, Sweden. Uh, all these slides will be put uh, on the on the internet, uh, on the website. So if you want to look into more compre uh, comprehensive reports, we have two, which are actually just finished and where you will also find uh, links and articles about theory, analysis, uh, the impact of uh, the project and so on. So you're welcome to, uh, to download. These will also be put on, the, on this uh, workshop's uh, website. And um, thank you very much for listening, if you did, because I couldn't see you. Thank you. I can't hear you. So thank you, Svein. Um, in a real life setting, you would have thunderous applause now, I'm sure, um, <laughs> because this, of course, is, is the underpinning of, of what we do. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat that I'm going to put to you, if I may. Um, the first question is about the data. How many participants were there per country for the ROSE project? Are they based on a large sample of the student population? And do they include both public schools and private schools? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, if you look, um, th there are lots of technical details that we can, can discuss. Most of this is, all, all of this is described in the references that I have. But in general, we could, uh, we, we have rather representative samples. Uh, but if, if you want to do it, say, for instance, in Uganda, uh, and uh, other African countries, you can't really rely on educational statistics. Our, tar our target group are the 15-year-olds that go to school, uh, that attend school at, at that age, uh, which in some countries, of course, is 
um, we sampled um, uh, uh, should have representative sample from each country and the uh, from each country they gave we had some guidelines on how the sampling should be and what the population should be and when they delivered their data uh, entered into the same file and we also asked uh, them to uh, to write a data collection report we had guidelines that uh, described it in norway we had about 2000 uh, um, 2000 uh, in the, in the sample 170 schools in some other countries they have much less finland had uh, the double uh, uh, double sample size uh, the, we recommended at least 25 pupils from at least 25 schools uh, and sampled private and public schools. So that's a short answer. Uh, we we did compare we did compare the sample with what we, we know is the population uh, main characteristics like gender distribution, age distribution, and and so on. Uh, so we have uh, done our best, but we can't compete with, say, the PISA and the TIMSS projects, the, the large ones, which are uh, officially run uh, and have to follow quite strictly the, the, uh, the, the, the guidelines given to them. I have also worked, actually, with the, with the TIMSS project. Okay. Um, there is another question. How is it possible to join the study? You have already said something about ROSIS and given contact information, but maybe the question given that we have such a diverse crowd of both astronomy educators from the um, that are that are practitioners, um, some astronomy education researchers, um, and of course we know that this this also varies a little bit by country, which part of the community are involved in education. So what qualifications would somebody need to bring to usefully participate in roses, for instance, I think the best thing is to uh, well, first of all, take a take a little look at the reports uh, that uh, you will put on 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 the uh, on the website, especially the first one, which gives uh, uh, the, the basic features of, of the project, and uh, also on my slide, last second last slide. I had the uh, the address to the to the new organizer of the, the Roses project because uh, that's emerging now. Um, some countries like Norway and Sweden have already collected data, but now with the COVID crisis, I think uh, it's it's a little problematic. But uh, get in touch with the organizers, and uh, they will uh, help you. All right. Um, there is one question that asks specifically about mathematics. Did you survey for interest in mathematics, also by gender, for instance? Was that no, about I, I mean, there is certainly a lot of literature uh, on that, um, but there is um, no similar study to uh, to mathematics. I know I have some South Africa. As you saw, I had a lot of we had a lot of African countries. In fact, that was. Partly funded by um, by Norwegian Research Council to for African countries to take part, and um, uh, one of my few of my colleagues there actually thought about developing something uh, similar to the mathematics um, uh, curriculum. But it's um, I would say I, I'm also a mathematician, but mainly nuclear physics was my main field. Um, it's much more difficult actually to put uh, to to ask to to. Uh, come up with um, questions uh, in mathematics in the same way. Uh, after all, um, uh, physics or natural science is empirical. It relates to the real, real world. Uh, the uh, basis for mathematics, of course, is, is rather different from the basis of natural science. So um, I don't know some, some studies like that. Thank you. And there's there are some questions and also a comment about the question of what is behind the different interests. So um, the comment is, I'm sure we all realize this, but important for us to remember that these are not necessarily intrinsic differences by gender, but rather how children of different genders are socialized by their culture to be interested sure. in X or Y. And sure. more specific, sorry, do you want to say something to that? Yeah, I, I can comment on that because um, 
it was uh, with some hesitance that I have uh, that we have divided um, the, um, the the results by gender because we wanted to be gender blind. So we did analysis in the first place, or by PhD student who is actually now a research director for our climate research in Norway. She she wanted to be gender blind. She didn't look at um, at uh, whether it was a uh, boy or, or girl, but she did analysis and then she did some uh, cluster analysis and different sorts of analysis in grouping children according to their choice. And when she opened the envelope or rather looked at uh, who uh, had greatest similarities in their response pattern, it came out to be extremely gendered. So uh, it's based on the data also that uh, we can now say, unfortunately, we get some empirical support for uh, very stereotypic uh, images of boys and girls uh, interested, but they came out of, of the data. They were not sort of built into our analysis from the first place. Details on this you will find on the second of the Rose Project uh, reports which goes in very much detail in, in how she got around um, making this analysis and grouping children according to patterns in their choices. There is another question on, on interest. Um, are they less interested in learning or are the students less, less uh, interested in learning about these things because they are less interested generally or because maybe they already learned about them at earlier stages of school or through the internet? So. Um, is it's, that something that you can distinguish or? No, we can't. Um, I mean, what we can do, uh, and of course, we should always take care when we make comparisons um, and be very open. Even, even the same word, like say science, can be in different countries translated, for instance, in Japanese, uh, which I don't know, but we have colleagues there. They say that the word science can be translated in different ways. Uh, some uh, so uh, interpreting data uh, from questionnaires should always be done with care, but our, our point is not really. It's more to have informed discussions with together with educators to try to understand the data and to explain the data and maybe also to uh, relate them to. Uh, national priorities or cultural uh, or linguistic uh, characteristics. So it's uh, it's not meant as, um, uh, as as judgment or for ranking, but rather to open up for scholarly discussions. And uh, our experience is that when we put these things in front of science educators on this on 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 uh, in conferences, it will always be interesting results in trying to understand what's behind uh, the answers that we have. And of course, there is a spread. What I've shown you is only the the mean value. And of course, there is boys are not the same. Uh, there is a spread in each country as well. I only gave you mean values. There's a related question, namely, was the study only survey based or were there any follow up interviews with some students to understand reasons behind the responses? Yeah, that's an interesting one, because um, uh, the um, this uh, this was done, um, the, the, the data collection in a way to, to provide us with the data that was uh, following uh, the same logistics. But in some countries, they um, also had group discussions with the pupils afterwards trying to understand how they related to the different uh, questions some of them were sort of qualitative uh, in analysis uh, um, and um, so that was done in and in some countries they also asked the teachers uh, for the class uh, whether they this had been treated in the classroom and so on so uh, uh, in many countries, uh, they use the ROSE questionnaire as a basis for also for other kind of data collection, trying to understand uh, the interests and priorities of young children. There's a, there's a related comment, namely um, one participant says what they have experienced is that different cultures can have very different responses to the very instrument of a questionnaire. For example, some might take questionnaires more seriously than others. Some might prefer to be more middle ground. 
Um, have there been attempts in, in rows to compensate for, for such effects? It's very difficult to compensate for that. Um, and, and the same question, I've, I've also worked with, with, uh, with, um, with the studies like uh, TIMS and, 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 and PISA. And you can see that uh, this is taken seriously by some, but not by others. Um, and uh, when you have the responses on the sheet of paper, they sometimes they only make kind of pattern uh, with the crosses, and then you can when you when you when you grade it, or systematically answer on one side, agree to everything or disagree to anything. So uh, um, we had some guidelines in when to uh, reject responses uh, and when when to accept. And the same they have to do in all these um, uh, international studies that uh, are ranking pupils. You have absolutely the same problems. It's, it's actually boycotted by some students and taken seriously by others. And we try to say to them that this is not a test. This is really because we want to hear your opinion. So you are not graded. Uh, it's no, no answer is correct. And that is a big contrast to the, uh, to the TIMS and the PISA study where you are held up against a common agreed standard. There is one uh, question that has led to lots of discussion on the, uh, in, the, in the chat on our event platform, and that uh, is related to STEM versus STEAM. So having the STEM subject, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or also putting the arts in there. I'll just read the question. Considering girls' interest in aesthetics, what do you think about STEAM education as a way of attracting girls to science? Well, it's not so important what I what I mean about this. But if you look at, uh, but I think this perspective uh, of uh, including not only the the A as uh, for arts, but also social science is is part of uh, what we address actually do address in this questionnaire. But because if you look at the items, also the items that I have just shown you, some of them are. Um, have a, 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 clear, a clear steam, uh, if you like, um, profile. Um, so, so I think um, in, in good teaching, uh, you always uh, you always have a context when you when, when you try to explain physical phenomena, for instance, which is my subject. Uh, a good explanation is always that you use examples. You try to connect it to something empirical, something in the in the in the real world. Uh, so no teaching is uh, without context, and uh, our point is that the context matters even even more. Uh, that's that's the entrance to to learning. Uh, motivation and the effective dimension and the interest is really the, the entrance to good learning. There's one specific question that is, of course, related to the fact that we have mainly astronomers and also maybe to the title that you gave your talk. So can we say from Rose that astronomy in general generates more interest than other sciences or would that be too strong a statement? It's, it's a strong statement, but uh, what you can say is that uh, um, some of these aspects that we now see in the astrophysics, as, uh, astronomy, and so on, is that we don't know the answer. We, we are still, there are new discoveries coming. Uh, we have open questions about this life in the universe and so on. So there is room not only for giving a correct answer, you can... You, you, you can you can speculate and you get new results. Nobody nobody have the the one correct answer. And I think this openness, um, uh, openness um, and uh, curiosity uh, and the spect spectacular thing about what's going on in space science uh, is a wonderful entrance because you can actually discuss it without one person sitting with a, a one final answer. And many aspects, very much in science teaching, you, you, you. The, the point is to have a correct explanation, and of course the same in mathematics. Um, and I think that that is something that, um, and then you are graded on uh, on standard scores, and there is something um, very bad about that. Uh, for instance, math anxiety is in many countries a kind of uh, 
uh, psychological diagnosis. And of course, math anxiety is not born with you. It's something you learn at school or in society. And I think the same thing is about uh, learning physics and other natural sciences. Uh, we should have more openness. Uh, we should, should have curiosity, fantasy, um, creativity, and all these things that we often can call uh, STEAM with, uh, with the arts and the social sciences uh, also included. Um, in fact, the discussion that has been going on in the chat, or one part of the discussion, is precisely about once more the question of of how do how do we get socialized to like certain things and about intrinsic interests? Um, is there a way that future studies, or can you think of a way that future studies could try to differentiate between those those different situations, whether there really is something like intrinsic interest or whether boys and girls, for instance, are socialized? differently when it comes to what is meant to interest or what, what, what is expected to interest them in science? Well, I think these are large questions and, uh, um, and um, there is a lot of research about uh, gender and what is natural, what is learned, what is culturally, what, what is heritage and so on. Uh, I, I think that we as educators should be more interested in uh, uh, in, in giving good teaching that can uh, uh, reach uh, students that may have different sort of inclinations. Um, but I, I, I would, um, I don't like biological explanations for anything because then you said, uh, I put some conclusion on it. And I think uh, that does, that is not very helpful. We can concentrate on giving good education that is reaching different sorts of students uh, and uh, be they boys or girls, but we have to know that there is a great diversity and that we should use all the channels that we have to, to reach their minds. But interest and motivation, uh, intrinsic interest and motivation is, is really the, the, the clue to all good uh, teaching and learning. I have one final question that is also, that goes in, into a more general direction as well. Um, do you envision a path or can you envision a path through which governments and education ministries would move forwards uh, towards adopting the UN educational policies of sustainability, global citizenship, peace, etc.? Because I mean, currently, currently these, these are not addressed explicitly in a, in a number of curricula. So can you envision a way forward there? Uh, I don't think there is one way forward here. I think this is very much up to to, to the national priorities uh, in each country. But I, I think it's it's really a dead end. We, we say that the quality of our, say, science education is measured by these international standardized tests. That is not taking us in the right direction because in each country, uh, education, at least when we talk about the um, obligatory education, that's that's where we also have to build on the, the the values, the culture, and the heritage of each country. To re, and it's a way of socializing children into to um, to become good citizens and also to learn the their own culture. And I don't think there is one international recipe and not one international blueprint or one national international standard against which we can measure the quality of school. So I think it's a dead end if we put too much belief in international comparisons and rankings like the one I started with on uh, I'm showing some data from the, from the PISA project. That's a dead end. Well, I mean, that is certainly, that is certainly a nice finish to this talk and to the question session, given that a lot of what we are going to do over the next days is exploring precisely the diversity of environments for teaching, in our case, astronomy and related subjects. And um, I think one of the main challenges that the, that the OAE faces is going to be to bring these things together. So where is it, where does it make sense to have, to find a consensus, to have content that is, of course, applicable internationally because it's it's simply astronomy and where and in which manner do we differentiate when it comes to the different countries um, and the 
variations in, in their needs, also what they need in terms of astronomy education resources. So um, it's a discussion that I think is going to take um, a lot of uh, a lot of space and with reason um, in what the Office of Astronomy for Education is planning to do. And I think we all, since this is the day when the Nobel Prize uh, was uh, was announced, I think we should all interest us a little for what Roger Penrose has written and as a humanist also about education. I think that can be a good finishing line for my presentation. Okay, so Svein, thank you very much for the keynote talk and also for answering the questions. And again, we are not in a situation where you can hear the applause, but I think the variety and number of questions shows you, gives you at least some feedback as to how well your talk was received. So thank you for, for sharing this. My pleasure, thank you. All right, so, and with this, we are fairly um, close to the end of this opening. Let me close by just doing a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I think most of you are by now familiar with how this event platform that we're using works. Um, I hear that there have been discussions in the chat already. So yes, use this to interact. If you want to talk directly to, the, to a person, there is a possibility of connecting directly with them. You can even ask in cases where you have a specific question whether they would like to connect via video. That too is possible via the platform. The experiment, of course, that we're going to do over the next few days is we're going to combine talks, panel sessions, and also events that are specifically meant to allow you to mingle. I mean, it's this is a network building event. Um, really the, the main protagonists and those that we really want to, uh, whose network we want to strengthen are our national astronomy education coordinators who play a very crucial role for what the Office of Astronomy for Education um, for education will do. So whenever you see in the program a meet and greet, that is the point where we would like to ask you to head over to the networking area and there be paired randomly with other participants. You will have three minutes to just catch up, get to know each other at least a little bit. And then after the three minutes, you will be paired with the next um, for the next one and one interaction. So this is, of course, a little bit artificial. It is not the same as standing around during a coffee break um, and uh, just mingling with people. Um, on the other hand, maybe does it uh, maybe it maybe it works better for those of us, and I count myself among those who have a little bit trouble maybe going to a group and joining the discussion. So in this way, we're all on an equal footing when it comes to to meeting other participants. Um, the algorithm in between, and I ask in particular the understanding of those participants who are not part of the NIAC um, network. Um, we are we've played a little bit with the with the algorithm um, so that there is some priority on the NIACs meeting other NIACs, so the National Astronomy Education Coordinators meeting other National Astronomy Education Coordinators, simply because that is the network that we primarily want um, to build. So again. Um, the, the pairing and the is not completely random, but we ask for your understanding of the rationale behind this. Um, another thing that you that you have already read, but um, that you should keep in mind, the sessions, um, most of the sessions happen twice. This is to accommodate those of you, those of us who are in different time zones. Um, we all know how difficult it is if you're in an, in an unfavorable time zone to join a conference um, at a specific time that is either very late or very early for you. So for most sessions, there will be one repetition. So you can choose which of those is more favorable to your own personal time zone. Of course, what is not going to be repeated is going to be the panels. The panels, um, the questions asked and answered, they're going to um, vary from uh, between, between the two repetitions. Of course, the talks themselves are pre-recorded and also after the workshop at some point, we're going to put them online. But during the talk, the speaker is going to be in the chat. So um, the, your chance is to listen to the talk, to put your 
uh, questions to the speaker directly in the chat um, and get direct answers. And so, so the, these are the these are the various ways of of interacting um, that we have planned for this particular workshop. Again, it's an experiment for us. We are particularly interested um, in seeing how many of you are going to be still with us on Friday. Um, after all, it is it is fatiguing to really participate very intensely in an event, um, but we're very look, much looking forward to this format and to interacting with many of you. And yes, so at this point, we're actually very good in our time. Um, so at this point, we come to the closing of the opening session. Um, the Office of Astronomy for Education, which started its work on 1st of January this year, uh, not only has been working for all those months, but with this opening event, it is now also officially opened. And I wish all of you a pleasant, interesting, stimulating, fruitful second Shaw IU workshop on astronomy for education.